Watch this. Ahead on this Friday edition of the 208, we're learning more about the deadly private hangar collapse that happened this week at the Boise Airport. We're hearing from first responders about their work as they arrived on scene. Yeah, it's Friday. Week flew by, especially down at the State House. So we're taking you through the week that was in that big building downtown, the debates, the drama, and the developments on votes. And February 2nd marks Groundhog Day. Happy Groundhog Day. So we're dialing back to introduce you to a familiar Boise friend. Maybe one you haven't seen in a few years. 208 starts right now. We now know the names of the three people killed in that deadly hangar collapse that happened Wednesday evening on Boise Airport property. 59-year-old Craig Durant from Boise, 24-year-old Mariano Coco from Nampa, and 32-year-old Mario Sontazzi from Nampa. The coroner's office says that they all died from traumatic blunt force injuries. And KTVB has confirmed that one of the victims, Craig Durant, is the brother of the owner of Big D Builders, the steel construction company that was building that hangar. This afternoon, we received a statement from a representative of Big D Builders, and the statement reads in part, quote, words cannot describe our pain and sorrow since Wednesday evening. We have lost family members and valued employees who were close personal friends. Representative also said that they're committed to working with OSHA to find out why the building collapsed, but they say they are thankful for the first responders in their quick action. This afternoon, representatives from several Boise agencies, they spoke about the tragic event and the heroic rescue efforts there. And our Andrew Bartline joins us from the scene of the collapse this evening with what they said. Andrew, what's the latest from investigators? Well, first, let's take a look at this scene, Joe. I try not to use adjectives when reporting, but it is large. It feels a little bit overwhelming. That's the sense I get from it, but it might be the small things that catch our eyes. Our photojournalist Logan will punch in on this. First thing I saw when I showed up, Joe, at the scene, this is different from what I've seen earlier, is flowers right on the side of the road. And as vehicles drive through as well, people are stopping with cell phones to take pictures and videos because it feels so out of place. We have some video we can roll for you now of what this scene has looked like throughout the last couple days as we've collected footage. You can see that kind of the lower part of the building where it's attached to the foundation is pulled up entirely as it's buckled in the middle. But the response is the big thing we heard from today when talking with these officials from the city and the county. That'd be Ada County paramedics, Boise Fire, Boise Police, uh, acute EMS, a private company stepping in, Canyon County helping as well. So they're looking at assessing this building, but also a big piece of it. We heard sort of the human aspect from the Boise Fire Chief today. Take a listen. We were communicating, Sean and I were communicating as well as Chief Weininger at our level as the chiefs uh, to make sure that all the operations were running smoothly and that everybody had what they needed to be successful. If you ask me, Mark, the human, there's sadness. As a responder, I've been a responder for over 30 years, Chief Rain the same. Uh, we've seen tragedy throughout our career. And as a responder, you do feel sadness uh, because we knew that we couldn't affect a positive outcome for everyone. It's nice hearing from Mark the human, not exactly or entirely Mark the police chief, but it took about 12 minutes for EMS to get there. We heard that from Ada County EMS. So Joe, a 12 minute response to get an ambulance on site, but Boise Fire by a little bit of stroke of luck already in a vehicle got there quickly, but their uh, airports at or their, their station at the airport, I should say, it's about 4,000 feet away, so they're going to get there quick regardless. Well, so. just the scene that you're showing us, Andrew, it shows the daunting task for investigators and uh, really everything that's going to happen in the coming days and weeks. Real quickly, I'm curious, it seems really quiet there. Um, have you seen a lot of action out there in terms of investigators or people going through the site today? One person walked by, said he's a worker on the site. I think he just wanted to get a look at it, did not want to talk to us. Some cars have driven by. It's kind of a side access road. Most of those people stopping to take pictures, video on their phone. Not a lot of noise, not a lot of people. Haven't seen a single person on the other side of that gate. We've been here for a few hours, Joe. All right, Andrew Bartline reporting for us here on the 208. Thank you so much, Andrew. And tune into the news at 6. For the latest on this, Andrew will be live out there, still working to get new information for you. You can also find the latest at KTVB.com and in Spanish on KTVB in Espanol. In Idaho politics today, I got quite a press release. Many of us did. I'm quoting here, too. This isn't a classic 208 parody joke. Here's a real headline we got. Attorney General Labrador defeats Satan, end quote. 
It seems like big news. What a Friday news dump. Jokes aside, that is actually what the release said, Labrador defeats Satan. But what does it mean? Well, it ties into the battle over Idaho's abortion laws, a very serious topic. This week, Idaho's AG says they successfully defeated the Satanic Temple's challenge to Idaho's Defense of Life Act. Chief U.S. District Judge David Nye has dismissed a lawsuit brought by the Satanic Temple. The suit claimed that the state infringed on the temple members' rights by denying them to the right of an abortion, as the group believes in bodily autonomy and has abortion rituals that are sanctioned by the temple. Similar efforts like this have been made in other states to fight against restrictive abortion laws. Now, uh, AG Labrador reacted to the dismissal, saying in part, the district court rejected every claim the Satanic Temple asserted and dismissed the case with prejudice. The court held that each claim lacked merit, even describing one of the Satanic Temple's positions as producing a, quote, blatantly absurd result, end quote. We also did hear back from the legal counsel of the Satanic Temple, W. James McNaughton, and they wrote to us in a statement in part, quote, the Idaho Attorney General argued that women forfeit their constitutional right to decide if and when they get pregnant simply by having sex. The Idaho Attorney General says that the only way to avoid the cost of an unwanted pregnancy is abstinence. The district court agreed. The Satanic Temple does not. Satanic Temple believes that women have a constitutional right to have sex without fear or any intention to get pregnant. Say TST, they say, also knew these profound constitutional and social issues would have to be resolved by higher courts. So they say they're going to appeal this decision to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. We will keep you posted. As per usual on the 208, all week we've been following new and evolving legislation that's coming out of the session in the early weeks. And it looks like Dr. Rhonda Thompson in Boise has been paying close attention. She said, so let's review this week in our legislative body. Teachers and guns, Wild West all over again. Legislative reps who had science classes 60 years ago before research was conducted on intersex people and have no desire to learn about intersex people, abide by their biblical teachings. We as a state are heading to a really hot place with 2L. Could be anything. Well, Rhonda, that was part of it. This week, we also focused on eight different bills, including hunting with collars, mandatory minimums, expanding the attorney general's powers, repealing the Blaine Amendment. Oh, and there's much more. Parental choice credit for schools, concealed carry licenses for school staff, defining gender and sex in Idaho code, as well as Medicaid conditions. So, well, there's a lot that happened this week. So why don't we wrap up the week that was? Here's your legislative recap. Monday, we introduced you to new legislation preventing people from requesting public records to find the location of wildlife so they can hunt it. Well, for a hunter to do that is completely unethical and against fair chase. House Bill 404 passed the House yesterday, 56 to 12, with two absent. It's now headed to the Senate. Also on Monday, we talked more about House Bill 406, which adds fentanyl to the list of drugs in Idaho that carry a mandatory minimum sentence and creates the crime of drug-induced murder. It took nearly two hours to debate it on the House floor. A lot of discussion about why this bill isn't the best option. This bill demands incarceration without making any distinction between dealers and users, without making any distinction between first-time people who made a mistake and serious bad guys. But others say something has to be done to curtail the drug crisis in the state of Idaho. We've already waited a year and lost Idahoans to the, this deadly drug. We need to act today. House Bill 406 passed the House 55 to 13 with two absent. On Tuesday, the bill was read for the first time in the Senate and referred to the Senate Judiciary and Rules Committee. On Tuesday, we touched back on House Bill 390, which expands the Attorney General's powers to investigate city and county officials. And I just don't see a compelling need to expand the powers of one individual. Despite pause from the Democrats, House Bill 390 passed the Idaho House and with overwhelming majority support after a 54 to 15 vote with one absence. That happened on Tuesday. Wednesday, the bill was read for the first time in the Senate and referred to a Senate State Affairs Committee. Also Tuesday, the controversial House Joint Resolution 1 was introduced to repeal the Blaine Amendment which is a law that regulates our schools and means that the state of Idaho it will not and cannot fund religious schools with public dollars, but... Repealing this constitutional clause would provide an easy path for the passage of ESA, school voucher, 
or tuition tax credit legislation. The argument? There is actually no such thing as an irreligious people. The resolution is held in committee. Chairman Crane could revisit it soon. If it moves on, the resolution would amend the Constitution, which needs a two-thirds majority at the State House. Then it would go to the ballot for a vote. Which brings us to that legislation introducing public dollars for private schools, House Bill 447. We saw it last session as an education savings account, but now it's a parental choice credit. It lets parents and legal guardians be able to choose educational services that meets the needs of their individual student. And it would allow parents to claim a tax credit up to $5,000 per student or $7,500 for kids with special needs. But there could be a hit to Idaho's general fund, up to $50 million each year. I absolutely defend and will promote a, a parent's right to choose where their child gets their education. Nothing about this bill touches that. House Bill 447 is now awaiting a public hearing in the House Taxation and Rev Committee. On Wednesday, the highly debated House Bill 415 was on its third reading on the House floor. The bill would allow school staff to conceal carry in Idaho. I support the idea that, and the concept of, of standing up for ourselves, and, but my, my real concern is that we're not authorizing and really demanding the training. The Idaho Parent Teachers Association, the Idaho Education Association, and even the Idaho Association of School Resource Officers have spoken against the proposed bill. Yet, it did pass the floor 53 to 16 with one absence. It is now filed for a second reading on the Senate floor. Yesterday, House Bill 421, proposing to make the word gender mean the same as sex when referring to male or female, was back in action. Self-proclaimed word girl, also known as Representative Julianne Young, says that it's necessary to have clear definitions to communicate and to craft policy. But making gender binary cuts out of part of the population, like intersex individuals. But it's not scientifically accurate. Despite its gray areas, House Bill 421 is set for a third reading on the House floor. Last but not least, House Bill 419. The bill would attach additional conditions to Idaho's Medicaid program. Medicaid is the second largest budget behind education. Now Republicans want to trim the fat, but supporters of expanding the program say there's just a disguise for the actual goal, to repeal the expansion entirely. No other state has uh, succeeded in getting the federal government to sign off on the exact same requests that this bill puts forward. The House Health and Welfare Committee is holding House Bill 419 for now, but Chairman Vander Wouda says they could bring it back soon. And that's a legislative wrap. And you, the great viewers of the 208, had a lot to say about the list of legislature that we covered this week. So we wanted to give a little extra time, as you always request, to get to some of your comments that we didn't have time for during the week. Like this one from Michal, talking about House Bill 421 on gender definitions, writing, I loved your piece explaining the meaning of intersex individuals. I worked in the NICU for several years as a nurse. We occasionally had babies born with what was determined as ambiguous gender. It wasn't common, but it definitely happened. This bill recognizing only two genders does a true disservice to intersex individuals as well as our trans community. Politicians should stop trying to make laws considering medical issues that they have no knowledge or understanding of. Thank you so much for the comment. Carol commented on House Bill 419 regarding Medicaid expansion, saying hashtag the 208. I remember what happened in our state before we had Medicaid expansion. Every year, there were stories about Idahoans who died because they couldn't afford health insurance. Shame on any legislator who wants to return to those days. Carol, again, thanks for the comments. A few comments on House Bill 415, allowing concealed carry for school employees. Larry, for example, said, amazing that anyone can get a gun, carry it anywhere in order to be a hero. The problem is there are no heroes unless you wear a badge or a military uniform. Everyone needs to stay in their own lanes. Hashtag the 208 from Larry. A lot of great comments. We're excited to see what comes out of our state house next week. We'll keep a close eye on it for you. Why do we trust a rodent to predict the spring weather? Can Punxsutawney Phil really predict the future? We're dialing back some science on the event while also reintroducing you to an old Boise friend at Zoo Boise. What do you think about Groundhog Day or really anything on the program? Text us, comments, questions, feedback, criticisms, comics, really anything. Here's our number, 208-321-5614. Please be sure to include your name and hashtag the 208. We're going to get to your comments live at the end of the show.
But what this weather did not provide is a shadow or reason to hide. Glad tidings on this Groundhog Day. An early spring is on the way. And just like that, the most famous groundhog in the world, Punxsutawney Phil, decided that we're all going to have an early spring. But did you know that back in the day, Zoo Boise had their very own Punxsutawney Phil? I'm sure many of you remember this. His name is Boise Bill, and he apparently retired in the past few years from his big day on February 2nd. In 2022, Bill's team posted, quote, honestly, it's a lot of stress having the whole world depend on you to predict the weather, and I needed to take a break. I've really been enjoying my time out of the spotlight and have been focusing on Zoo Boise's conservation fund, end quote. So we appreciate that from Bill and his team, but we wanted to know how accurate is the Groundhog's prediction? Well, on this day in 2016, Brian Holmes brought us a special report. Ladies and gentlemen, Punxsutawney Phil. They've put their faith in Phil since the 1880s. Is this current warm weather more than a trend? Perchance this winter has come to an end. Or perchance a groundhog in Punxsutawney possibly seeing his shadow is a pretty weird way to watch the weather. So here's the thing with the shadow. February 2nd marks the halfway point between spring and winter. The story goes that if Phil sees his shadow like on a fair day like today, then the worst of winter is ahead of us. But if he doesn't see his shadow, the worst of winter is behind us. Meteorologist Larry Gebert believes in a simple supposition. I mean, if you think about the temperatures in the east, they've been up around the 40s, 50s, and that same thing happened today. So the fact that they're going to have an early spring actually makes sense. So how can a rodent in Pennsylvania predict the rest of winter for the rest of the country, particularly here in the Pacific Northwest, where in Boise, we tend to look to the prairie dog, who right now is tending to keep his shadow in his home. Well, neither rodent is actually reliable. In fact, according to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or the federal agency that tracks this stuff, Phil has only been accurate four out of the last 10 years. There is no shadow to be cast. An early spring is my forecast. As for the gem state, so far winter in southwestern Idaho has been kind of a mixed bag. While we've seen a stellar season when it comes to snowfall in the mountains and for the ski resorts, down here in the valley, we've seen above average temperatures and below average precipitation. So with a shadow shown this morning, we should see a rough second half. If only we weren't in an El Nino, which usually means a warmer, drier winter for the Northwest. But Phil and the rest of his rodent family is right on about one thing. Timing is everything. I think that if you really think about it for a moment, uh, to predict six more weeks of winter, when you take February 2nd to March 21st, 22nd, it's pretty much six weeks. Of course, all of this groundhog business is about as reliable as seeing an actual prairie dog here at Zoo Boise in the middle of winter. Brian Holmes, Idaho's News Channel 7. And by the way, we are in an El Nino this year in case you're keeping score at home. But Brian touched on this. Did you know that the prairie dogs basically are local groundhogs? They have a special exhibit at Zoo Boise named for KTVB legend Larry Gebert. Larry would go visit Boise Bill every year on Groundhog Day. And we miss you, Larry, so, so much. But your fun memories, including Boise Bill and all your live shots with him, they live on forever. Larry Gebert is always the first person that I think of on Groundhog Day. So we love you so much, Larry. And yeah, go visit the Larry Gebert Prairie Dog Exhibit over at KTVB. And I'm curious, you guys could text in if you remember watching Larry in the morning. Oh, who is this? Who has showed up, Boise Bill? Good to see you. Okay, well, Boise Bill, I know he retired uh, from predicting the weather on Groundhog Day, but he has made a special appearance here on the 208. So, Bill, thanks for all your work over the years. We appreciate it. We're going to take a break. You and I will continue our chat. But the 208, we'll be right back. So what have you been up to these days?
It is Friday and I want to help get you ready for the weekend. So here's what we're looking at throughout Sunday. We've got more mild temperatures sticking around for us. It is warmer than average for this time of year across many spots in the region. We're also looking at continued chances of valley rain. However, there will be less places seeing valley rain than places seeing mountain snow. However, those totals will be different depending on elevation. So we're looking at six to 10 inches above 6,500 feet, which is more than we have been able to talk about, but not quite the massive storm that we can get this time of year. So the key is going to be that 6,500 foot range and lower elevations. We could see two to four inches right around that 5,000 foot range and then less than 5,000 feet. We'll see some of those lighter snow accumulations, but we are still talking about heavy wet snow falling across the, the central mountains. Some of the highest accumulations are expected there. That's also why we have an avalanche warning in place. So please be careful if you are planning to go in the backcountry. And this is because we have a heavy wet snow and you might be wondering, well, what is a heavy wet snow? Check out these trees. I think it paints the picture really well. You can see them way down as the snow is falling over in Bogus Basin. So that's what we're looking at because the temperatures are warmer. There's a little bit more moisture with this system. Uh, again, that heavy wet snow, if it was colder temperatures, it would be the lighter powdery snow. So you can see those precipitation chances will be sticking with us throughout the weekend and through tonight, but looking pretty mild in the city of trees. You can see those 40 sticking around. We'll be right back to wrap up the 208 after this. All right, we'll take a look at your comments to end the show. So many of you commented about Boise Bill, so he agreed to hang out for a few more minutes before heading to his weekend. Thanks, Bill. All right, here are the comments. Bibles, praying, religion, and guns in schools. Great, what's next? Grenades and lunchboxes. Could be, you never know. Probably not. Uh, this person says, I can't believe that I find myself agreeing with the Church of Satan. It's actually the Satanic Temple. They're two different organizations, actually. 
uh, fun fact. Uh, they're the ones fighting Christian nationalism. That's Tony from Boise. Thank you, Tony. Appreciate your comment. This person says, I would uh, just as soon use a, a groundhog shadow to determine which legislation passes in Idaho. We'd have a better chance at good legislation than with this bunch at the Capitol. That's an opinion from David in Boise County. Uh, this person says, if you're an Amity Elementary student or alumni, this should be declared the most important holiday of the year. Go Groundhogs. Oh, yeah. Sandy and McCall's right. And this person says, I like your co-anchor today. Me too. Boise Bill and I are going to roll out into the weekend. I hope you and your family enjoy the weekend. We'll see you next week.